I was very much struck by how the translation of the biblical writings jump-started the development of literacy across the entire world. Illiteracy was the norm. The pastor's home was the first school, yeah. and every morning it would begin with singing. The Christian faith is a singing religion. Probably 80% of scripture memorization today exists only because of what is sung. And you know, there's a big anthropological mystery, which is that from, from the period of time about 350,000 years ago to about 50,000 years ago, there doesn't seem to have been much of an increment in human well-being on the material front. And no one can really figure that out because genetically speaking, we're not that much different from our ancestors that long ago. And so what changed? And who knows the answer to that? But one possible answer is that, well, we were caught in something like a, a self-defeating spiral of envy such that, and there's good anthropological evidence for this, so that in most societies, anyone who had any more than anyone else immediately became a target for thugs and predators who just killed them and took what they had. And that just stops all economic growth whatsoever. And so if there's no tolerance for, if there's no tolerance for inequality, it's possible that there's no way of generating wealth because wealth has to start somewhere and then be distributed. It can't be everywhere at once, instantly. Just described is what has uh, driven, in, in our times, the radical left, to grow this massive controlling government, the, the, the state uh, that is going to be the great leveler, that is going to you know, equalize everything and redistribute the wealth and, and all of these other policies they produce. Um, because what they're doing really is uh, institutionalizing uh, envy and division and, and hatred for that matter. It's uh, you know, class envy and it's how they divide. It's a Marxist principle really to turn the population to get some to eat one another, but they, they've had some success with that. And so again, back to what conservatives should be doing right now, we have to push back against that. We have to explain to people what the origin of these crazy policies is and what the antidote is. And I, I think, again, that the solutions are the guiding principles. I think what guided our country from its origin is what needs to guide us again. And uh, it's, it's not a difficult argument to make if you have enough time to lay these principles out. Johnson, who is one of America's leading figures on the federal conservative front, Representative Mike Johnson is in his third term representing the 4th Congressional District of Louisiana. He represents nearly three quarters of a million residents of 15 parishes in the northwest and western regions of the state. Mike was first elected to the U.S. House of Representatives on December 10th, 2016, by the largest margin of victory in his region in more than 50 years, and is currently serving his third term. He earned his undergraduate degree in business administration from Louisiana State University in 1995, and then his Juris Doctorate from the Paul M. Hebert Law Center at Louisiana State University in 1998. Before joining Congress, Johnson was a partner in the Kitchens Law Firm and a senior attorney and national media spokesman for the Alliance Defense Fund, now known as Alliance Defending Freedom. He serves in a very important position in Washington as the vice chairman of the House Republican Conference, the number four ranked Republican in Congress, is a leader on the Judiciary and Armed Services Committees, and serves as an assistant whip for House Republicans. Last Congress, he served as chairman of the Republican Study Committee, known as the Intellectual Arsenal and the largest caucus of conservatives in Congress. Prior to becoming elected to the US Congress, Johnson served as a constitutional law litigator for nearly 20 years. We're gonna to talk today about his political career, about his philosophical views. Three fourths of Americans are so deeply concerned about the future of their country that it is causing them daily stress. And that's a real statistic, according to them. So uh, there is a lot of concern. And the reason is because these are the results, the completely foreseeable results of policy choices that have been made by those uh, who control all these levers of power. And so the results have been disastrous. There is quite literally a, a crisis on every front. 
Every front, every issue of policy is a disaster. Uh, President Biden has presided over that. The Democrats in Congress have engineered it, and we are living through the results. And so, uh, I, I, to summarize it easily on the campaign trail, to me, I've, I've been saying for the last year that it will come down to, and I think it has, uh, to what I call the three I's. Um, it's uh, inflation, illegal immigration, and general incompetence. And the polling bears that out, uh, that, that those two top issues, of course, the economy is, is in a disastrous state right now. The cost of living is unmanageable for most Americans. And uh, the illegal immigration problem is, is just an unspeakable disaster, catastrophe. And, and uh, the incompetence uh, is, is something that has spread throughout everything they've touched. It, the crime uh, is soaring in the country and all of our major cities and, and around the, the nation. Uh, every single area, uh, energy policy, uh, you know, we have a fentanyl crisis. We have, uh, we have a, for crying out loud, we have a baby formula shortage crisis. We have military recruitment crises. I mean, it's just every area. And so the American people are, are looking for a change. They're going to give us that opportunity, and I believe we're going to deliver on it. Well, we know by any objective measure that inflation in the U.S. is at uh, at least a 40-year high. When, when it actually boils down to real people, real families, there's, they're feeling real pain. Um, you know, the cost of groceries, the cost of gasoline. And, and again, all of this is the result of, of these policy decisions. You know, take energy policy, for example. In the U.S., uh, at, at least 30 percent of our nation's economy is tied in some way to our energy policy. And, and you and I have talked about this all offline with, amongst our friends and groups that we're involved in. It is just really an insane series of decisions that Biden and the, and the, the far left in this country have made. Uh, we were energy, not just energy independent, but energy dominant. But in order to meet our demand, we then had to go hat in hand to OPEC. We had to go beg, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia. We had, to, we had to go and beg these other nations to help us supply our need. It's just unconscionable. unconscionable. And of course, the, the energy that's produced in those other countries is not anywhere near as clean and efficient as that which is produced here because uh, the, the, of the way they do it. Well, also pursuing a policy of going around the globe and asking for excess energy resources from, from obviously from producers who are not necessarily reliable, let's say like Venezuela or desirable, and also who don't abide by the same standards of environmental purity that govern the situation in the United States. Like, I don't understand how that, that policy can be constructed and pursued. What, what, what's the rationale for it? Is it that, I mean, we had a deputy prime minister in Canada who said famously something like, well, it's good that energy prices are much higher because when Canadians pay more at the pump, they're all reminded constantly of just how severe the environmental crisis is, and which I think is an absolute, utterly appalling way to behave. And I also think it's counterproductive on the environmental front because making people poor does not make the planet healthier. There's, there's no evidence for that. So what do you think, why do you think the Democrats pursued this policy? <laughs> 